After five months of sun, sand, and Sigatera, it's time to get out of the Bahamas and out of the hurricane zone. We are headed to the Chesapeake Bay in the United States, 950 nautical miles north of where we're anchored now in Spanish Wells, Eleuthera. That's about the same as a three hour flight, 15 hours by car, or five days of sailing. What a stupid way to travel. At least it's quicker than a three week kangaroo ride. Anyway, as I said, this leg will take us from Spanish Wells. It's in the northern end of Eleuthera, Bahamas, and we'll sail to Beaufort in North Carolina, USA. Yep, that's 134 hours to go over the trip right there. It's 8 a.m. and we've cleared our Beluthra. That was after a three hour wait, which is, let's face it, 10 minutes in Ireland time. The customs officer showed up. The office seemed to be customs looking at the outside. But inside, it was customs meets a warehouse, a concrete area loaded with boxes and a trolley jack with an office in the back corner. Obviously, to know what you're doing, you don't need all the bells and whistles because this officer was definitely more than capable. With those formalities out of the way, we pulled up the anchor, the mainsail is up, as we now unfurl the headsail. I really hope that this passage is more comfortable than our previous one to two day passages. I'm optimistic. I have more sailing experience and boat know-how since leaving the US and we should have a chance to get into a routine over the next five days. The sails are up and we are off to a great start with good speed. Only one hour into the trip and the wind angle shifted to downwind at about 160 degrees. This made for a frustrating sail because the wind falls into a dead spot. Meanwhile, dust and cast expletives into the sea. No one was listening. He also cast his fishing line to the seas which also brought no response. Soon after, the wind died altogether. This evening, the wind arrived. So after six hours, the engines went off. Uh, It's cool both visually and physically to see the wind arrive as it swallows the water's calm surface. I could see it coming in the distance, white cats galloping across the water as it moved closer and closer. Then the cool wind hit and it was game on. Passing Freeport off Grand Bahama was a game of dodging boats. I saw pleasure vessels, like us, anywhere from 14 to 50 metres. But when cruise liners and 300 metre long cargo tankers are thrown into the mix, 
It makes my night a nail-biting one. I was on watch when the chart plotter showed a 273-metre tanker was due to pass in front of us within half a mile. Dustin was off shift and finally getting some much-needed shut-eye. I sat in the dark at the helm for almost an hour, glancing between the horizon and the chart plotter, which showed the AIS's recalculation every few minutes of how close the tanker would pass me if neither of us altered course. When the tanker appeared on the horizon, on its continued heading about 20 minutes out from us, I ventured downstairs to wake the captain and tell him of my conundrum. Leary-eyed Dustin, who had just settled off to sleep, came back on shift. He radioed the ship, asked their intentions, and then altered our course. This all made sense in hindsight. But when I'm faced with these things, I'm not sure if making contact is just needless interruption. I guess I lack the confidence to make a move without Dustin's confirmation. But when I witness enough procedures, I can eventually take on simple yet anxiety-ridden tasks myself. I'm just not there yet. I do wonder though, if other newbies have the same experiences, the same anxiety around simple tasks that are internalized and then blown out of proportion in your mind. It's the second day of passage and the wind is having a laugh at only six to 11 knots from downwind. Luckily, we are now in the Gulf Stream, which is giving us a three to four knot push. So we're maintaining speeds at about seven to 10 knots. We're unsure of the immediate destination. The destination while on passage is somewhat of a fluid idea. To enter into a port though, we do like to do it in certain safe conditions. Most importantly is a favorable tide. If the tide is running out while the wind is blowing in the opposite direction, steep standing waves can form which make the entry precarious. Daylight is also preferred so we can see the sea state clearly and avoid any uncharted obstructions such as the movement of shoals or unlit fishing boats. Crew morale often takes a back seat as it changes hourly, depending on sleep, food, weather, and if the fish have been caught. Basically, even if we aren't feeling upbeat, if there's no port to enter safely, we have to suck it up and make the best of things. It doesn't help that Dustin doesn't get much sleep when I'm on shift. He's too worried if he leaves me to my own devices that he'll wake up on the boat being docked with a sail sign on it. This will change with time though as I grow confident and then his confidence will grow in me. Port Canaveral was the first port we considered, but the Gulf Stream was scooting us along, so we decided to crack on. We at least saw a rocket launch, albeit from the stream. How are you doing? Out of distance. That can be after all week. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, we have ignition and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket. There it is. Can you see much with that? see the I've just come on watch and we're continuing up the Gulf Stream. Days are dull until they're suddenly not, and you have to be 100% on the ball. We implemented a three hour watch rotation between the two of us. So while one of us is at the helm, well, should be at the helm rather than tormenting the crew, this time off for the other is to allow a decent block of sleep between eating and messing around at handover. I often have a list of tasks I want to do when I'm on shift, but when it comes to it, we're either doing sailing stuff, eating, or trying to fight fatigue by reading a book or listening to podcasts. Or I'm simply staring off in the distance and contemplating my life decisions. 
These dull times can be abruptly interrupted by the sound of a fishing reel spin. Oh, it's about it. You should have seen how high it's now. It's gone. That's no, back there. It's still back there. That's the other one. Oh, we are on. We are on. Oh, we are on. Oh, it's trying to spit it. It's still on. <laughs> then, alas, return to the dullness when that large dolphin fish throws your hook and gets away. We did catch a little tunny later, which gave us a snapshot of excitement. Something, but... Oh no! Well, you're half a fish! <laughs> Is it half again? Oh no. What is it? This is what we call finito in Australian parlance. Will it taste finito? No. It tastes fast. It's not a finito, these are um, a friggin' tuna. Sorry. I'm not sure what they're actually called here. Our lonely passage was livened up when we serendipitously came across Arakai another Aussie boat who we met in Nassau. It was funny and comforting to hear them, who, as experienced sailors, are also changing their minds on destination every hour. Our destination has changed again several times. Our options are further restricted beyond just weather. The site also has to be a port of entry for customs. We're headed to St. Simons, Georgia. No, no, we'll go to Beaufort, North Carolina. Charleston, South Carolina. Wilmington, North Carolina. Wait, char uh, both. Uh. On deciding to head for Wilmington, we witnessed the infamous green flash of the setting sun. Battery's going low. I'll turn itself off and get a green flash. What parts of the Caribbean? <gasps> that was definitely green. Yeah, that's green. That was definitely green. Yeah, that's green. Hmm. It was a calm night, running downwind, wing on wing, with 10 knots of wind. But when Dustin came on at 4 a.m., the winds were up to 15 knots. By 6 a.m., they were in the low 20s, and we needed to reef the mainsail. We have a hook and single line reefing, which ordinarily requires turning the boat into the wind and waves to reef the mainsail. But that's not something we want to do in these conditions. Fortunately, Dustin thought up a method to reef the main while sailing downwind. Unfortunately, we hadn't had a chance to practice the reefing method. Very good. Yeah. Can you pass me a bit of tape? So, there was no time like the present. Dustin recapped the reefing plan in the safety of the cockpit. Then we donned the life vests and safety tethers and got started. My mouth instantly got dry as a bone and the anxiety shot up within me, but I knew Dustin would guide me through. Clear verbal communication and more importantly, hand signals are something we've worked hard on. We can't hear a thing over the ocean and the wind howling. It actually went fantastically well and took only five minutes. It was much quicker and safer than turning the boat and the mainsail was reefed. We headed towards Wilmington and as we came off the deep water, the seas really let us know they were there. We had two to three metre swell, 
splashing salty water over the deck and into the cockpit. Now we're wet and salty with no sleep in sight. Over a distance of 10 miles, we went from 500 meter depth to about 50 meters. The ocean settled amazingly quick, even though the wind persisted at 15 to 20 knots. We sailed on and saw pilot whales and dolphins. I mentioned to Dustin that having to breathe air was a stupid decision on the dolphins' part. They should have picked gills. He laughed hysterically, but I'm still unsure why. What are you doing? Pardon? What are you doing? Talking to the dolphins. What else would I be doing? The question is, why aren't you? And he thinks I'm the crazy one. At 30 nautical miles from Wilmington, North Carolina, we again weighed our options. Course change for Beaufort, North Carolina it is. The problem is we have to slow the boat down to come in on the right tide. So we need to repeat our downwind reefing maneuver to reduce the sail further. But this time I feel calm about it. As we enter our fourth night, we are still moving too fast and we'll get into Beaufort during the run out tide. This won't be safe. The head sail's now been felled away. With only a reefed main up, we're still moving too fast. It is at these times when I'm uncomfortable, have had little sleep. The boat is damp and salty, and we are getting thrown around by wind and waves that I start questioning whether sailing is right for me. Is one season enough? Are the highs worth these lows? Maybe the highs only seem high in comparison to these lows. I try and be mindful. There's no point stewing on these thoughts. And things will look brighter without the fog of fatigue crashing in around me. We just, we, we need to push on and get anchored, sleep and eat. I really do try to be mindful, that is, until the next drama hits. It's 2 a.m. The wind has hit 25 knots and gusting to 30. The swell is bigger, the boat is rollier, and the wind is colder, and we are wetter. No one is going to sail this boat for us. There is no opting out at this point. The only path is forward. Time to drop the main. It's been a long 10 hours since the wind first picked up. We've been sailing with bare poles for a few hours and still clocking four to five knots as squall after squall have rolled over us. Conditions have settled enough now for Dustin to send me off for some shut eye. It's three hours later, but I fell asleep surrounded by the ocean and awoke startled, surrounded by buildings and boats. Dustin telling me it was time to prepare to anchor. We apparently arrived right at the bottom of the run out tide with the sun struggling to break through the fog. We will stay here for a few days to clear into the country and reprovision before moving further north. It's time now to get that sleep. Plus, 
hurricanes in America. Less. 